Um, I'm hitting record here because I want a rendition of what's on the uh, what's on the board. All right, here's the deal. We're, what he was just showing us was what's called a modified Atwood's machine. And Atwood's machine is basically just this. We have a mask going over a single fixed pulley. We have another mask going over a single, whoa. I did not hang the same mass on both sides. So when, as soon as I put it on the pulley, it wanted to accelerate downward. That's not where I want to start at. I want to start with um, having the same amount of mass on both of these. So this way, when I restring it on top of the strings, okay, now it's in equilibrium, right? This is called an Atwood's machine, right? Um, the, one that he was just showing us is what's called a modified Atwood's machine. That was the title of the lab activity that I want you guys to do. All right, so we're gonna start with taking a look at this in terms of a free body diagram for each of these two masses. All right, uh, this is gonna be mass number one on this side. This is gonna be mass number two on that side. Over here, mass number one, its free body diagram is going to have its weight downward, weight one, which is equal to mass one times acceleration from gravity. In since it is not falling, that means that the tensional force here must be equal to the same size as the weight. Otherwise, there would be a net force and it would be accelerated. So we have a tensional force upward, and we'll pretend I drew those the same size. We have a tensional force upward, which happens to be equal in size to the weight. Why is it equal in size to the weight? Because the acceleration was equal to zero. The acceleration was equal to zero. That leads us to the sum of the forces is equal to zero, which led us to this force must be equal to that force. And again, we'll pretend that those are drawn perfectly to size. Okay, I can't do it anymore. I got to do this because that was just too large. Okay, better. Over here on this side, we have mass two. And mass two has weight two, which is mass two times acceleration from gravity. And it has a tension upward, which that's too big. All right, it has a tension upward. Now, technically, this is tension one over here. This is tension two over here. Tension two is, again, equal to weight two because he's not accelerating. Now, here's one of the nice things about tension. Tension is the same everywhere throughout a string. If I grabbed a spring scale, spring scale, uh, spring in here, I can pull down, it compresses the spring, I can read measurements off of the scale. This is also a push-pull scale, which means I could push from this side and it would also give me the same values. Now, if I put the spring scale if I took him off, I attached a spring scale here and I hung him here, this guy would stretch out by a value that's equal to his weight. Uh, this is 100 grams, so that value would be almost exactly one Newton. If I measured it over here, it would tell me that the tension is one Newton to balance out the one Newton of weight. If I brought it over here, disconnected this, put him in the middle, it would also say one Newton. Turns out that for a string, Everywhere throughout the string, the tension is the same. If I cut the string up here, tie that into here, tie that into this side, and I supported it so its own weight didn't mess things up, then it would stretch out exactly one Newton Y. A lot of people think this is pulling down one Newton, this is pulling down one Newton, this thing should read two Newtons. It does not. It is one Newton everywhere throughout the string. Um, okay, so we get this um, tensi that they're equal to each other. So what does that mean? That means that uh, tension one is equal to tension two is equal to, we'll just call it tension. Right. So in the future, when it's one string, we won't say tension one and tension two. Okay. Now, that is a free body diagram for each of the two parts of this system. Now, either of those by themselves are not going to give me the acceleration 
if I were to change one of these masses, like the way it was when I first started. If I want to look at how the whole system accelerates, I should look at the whole system. Now, if I'm going to look at the whole system, I kind of have to decide which direction is positive. Right? I'm going to end up putting a greater weight on this side so that this one goes down, this one's going to go up, my string up here is going to go to the right. I'm going to concentrate on this part up here where it's going to the right. And I'm going to say that, well, going to the right, which is the direction of my acceleration, I'm going to say that's the x direction. Now, what's nice about that is it means that the y direction has no net force. We choose our axes so that we put the x direction in the direction that it will accelerate. Okay? That way, the other direction is perpendicular to that. And the forces in the y direction, if there are any, are going to cancel. Now, here's a problem. X is the direction it's accelerating. It's accelerating, accelerating, accelerating. Wait, what's it doing here? And now it accelerates this way. My thumb was always pointing in the direction of the string. So over here, X is down, Y is to the right. Over here, because if I trace this back this way, hard to move my hand that way, I get X going this way. Right. X is the direction of acceleration when I put excess mass over here. Uh, now, what's nice about that is I can now draw my free body diagram so that it gets rid of the changing direction. I'm going to draw my free body diagram for the system. And when I do that, I am going to put my x direction to the right. So here is my system. I have box number one. I have some string, which I'm straightening it out in the X direction. That string went over two pulleys. I'm just putting these circles here to remind myself that in reality, it went over two pulleys. And then I had mass number two over there. I'm gonna get rid of the X axis here just because it's kind of in the way. And that one over there. We got that idea already. I have one force that is external to this system, and that is the weight in the weight one, which is pointing that way. The weight two is pointing this way. And right now, while it's in equilibrium, weight one is equal to weight two because we have zero acceleration. Okay. Uh, and again, if acceleration is equal to zero, then weight one equals weight two, which it should since this was 100 grams and this was 100 grams. Now we're going to change the system up. All right, so I'm going to go to a case two. Here, we might as well say it over here. Uh, case one, case one had mass one equaling mass two equaling 100 grams. Okay, they were the same. Ma uh, case two, mass one is equal to 100 grams. I'm gonna make mass two equal to 150 grams. We did 200 earlier and it broke everything. So I'm gonna just go small here. Okay, so I'm gonna put another, let's double check. Yep, that says 50 on here, and if I let go, he's going to accelerate down. Not ridiculously fast, because there's not a big difference in force. Now, what I'm going to do is, so he can let go, I'm going to take a magnet and put him there so it lets me uh, move around. Okay, now with case two, and I wish I could use multiple colors, but it just doesn't show up on the video as well as black does. In case two, my free body diagram, one. Oh, by the way, guys, did you notice I did not draw in tension? Tension is an internal force. Internal forces cannot change the motion of an object. So we don't draw them. Think about this for a second. Over here with mass one and over there with mass two. 
it's a mass. It's made out of elementary particles, but we're not drawing intermolecular forces between the individual atoms. Turns out they all cancel. All internal forces produce no effect. If your car is stalled on the side of the road and you're trying to push it down the street half a block to the gas station, you're not going to accomplish anything if you stay in the car and push against the dash. That's an internal force. Well, it turns out that the dash pushes back against you. Those two forces cancel each other out. Internal forces always cancel. So we don't even draw them usually if we're doing a free body diagram. All right, so we've got one over there. It still has weight one going this way. We're going to calculate it this time. Weight one is, and actually I take that back. I'm just going to leave it at the mass one, mass two. I'm going to wait on my numbers here because we can get something nice out of just the variables. Weight two is now bigger, all right, uh, than it was last time. And so we got weight two over here, which is still equal to mass two divided by G. I'm gonna erase some of the board so I got some space to work with. Trying to not drop everything. Okay, that gives me a little bit of space. All right, our acceleration on our system. Our acceleration is equal to our net force divided by, well, all of the mass that gets accelerated. When it's more than one mass involved, I put a summation symbol on there, okay? This is whatever mass is getting accelerated has to be here. This net force is equal to weight one, which I'm putting in there as, whoopsie, I just realized something. Weight one was pointing in the negative x direction. I want the positive one first. So I'm gonna put weight two Weight two is pulling it in the positive direction. So then I'm going to add my negative weight one and adding a negative is subtraction. So weight one, so weight two minus weight one is my net force. My mass is of course mass one plus mass two. All right, I'm gonna make a substitution in here. Mass one times G minus mass two times G divided by still mass one plus mass two. And I apologize, my M's get very lazy. Just get used to it. That happens all the time for me. Uh, I'm gonna pull my masses out of here, okay? My acceleration is equal to mass one minus mass two divided by mass one plus mass two, if I put those ones in parentheses, I might as well put these ones in parentheses, uh, multiplied by G on the outside. Now this is something kind of interesting. The rate of acceleration is some sort of mass minus another mass. Now, if these were in grams, I'd have grams on the top and I have a summation of grams on the bottom and my grams would cancel out. If I took the time to switch it over to kilograms, I have some number of kilograms minus some other number of kilograms, so that's kilograms on top, divided by kilograms plus kilograms, that's kilograms on bottom, kilograms on top, kilograms on bottom, they cancel out. So I'm, I can actually get away this time around with using grams instead of kilograms, which makes our lives a little bit easier. Let's get a number for this thing. All right, so mass one is 100 grams, uh, there it is. 100 grams, mass two is, oops, I crisscrossed them again, guys. From here to here, I flipped the two and the one. And I did it again here. Now, how did I notice that? Because I just realized I was gonna subtract something bigger from something smaller and get a negative acceleration when I know it's gonna accelerate in the positive direction. Okay, so let's try that again. Uh, we've got uh, 150 grams minus 100 grams divided by 150 grams plus 100 grams, and then it's going to be multiplied by uh, 9.81 meters per second squared. Notice I didn't put my units up here because I already know they're going to cancel out. So I've got 50 divided by 250 
that is uh, one fifth or 0 0.2. 0 0.2 times 9.8 gives me something that I need a calculator for. Uh, 0 0.2 times 9.81, uh, 1.96. 1.96 meters per second squared. This is my theoretical acceleration. Right? Why am I calling it theoretical? Because I, guys, I just noticed something. I am using the wrong camera. All right, I apologize. You guys were putting up with the one that had the glare the whole time. This way is a little fuzzier, but it completely gets rid of the glare, uh, which is what I prefer to use. And most people vote that this one's the easier one to view. Okay, that's nice. I have a theoretical acceleration. The acceleration that I expect to see based on how much mass I have here and how much mass I have here. Now let's check it experimentally. All right, I'm going to clear a few things out here. Actually, do I need to? Yeah, I'll clear a few things out here. Might as well leave my values in there. Okay, now what I want to do is, oh, by the way, guys, I would like you all to get out your cell phone if it's not already out. And on your cell phone, I would like you to open up the clock app. I want to use some stopwatches. Okay. You guys have stopwatches built into your uh, clock app. I'm assuming it's the same way on an iPhone. Um, and we're going to time how long it takes for this thing to fall from here down to the bottom of the board and clatter on that thing. Now, we also should measure our distance. And so... I'm, I'm going to adjust this. I'm going to adjust that. So it's 80 centimeters above the bottom. So I have a, so I have a delta X that is equal to 80 centimeters or 0 0.80. Uh, meters. Why do I want meters? Because my acceleration was in meters per second squared. Um, the time is what you guys are going to measure for me. Now, anytime that you are interacting with different people and one person is releasing something and other people are using their stopwatches, it is good to communicate so that you don't have reaction time for them starting it. So the way I suggest that everybody do it is that you go with three, two, one, now. Okay, so we're going on the now, not on the one, All right? So when I say now, after counting it down, you guys will hit start. This thing will drop down here, little more than half a second, less than one second. It is going to clatter on the bottom and you guys are going to uh, record what that duration is. Okay, so I'm going to remove the magnet. I've got my uh, thumb holding it in place. I'm going to release my thumb on the now. Get ready with your stopwatches. Three, two, one, now. Okay, everything didn't fall. Usually it all falls. Okay, before we get going here, I'm going to uh, call on you guys. All right, so our experimental value for time, once we averaged eight values, was 1.08 seconds. So our uh, acceleration from these numbers is, our, is two times the displacement divided by the time squared. Same thing we've seen a couple of times now. Uh, two times 0 0.80 meters divided by 1.08 seconds getting squared. I cannot tell you how many times I have forgotten to enter that square on my calculator. That means that our experimental value of acceleration
is 1.37, 1.37 meters per second squared. Okay, so we got an acceleration that is less than what we expected. Uh, in order to compare them, we want to use relative error. And relative error is very much like percent error in chemistry, only I don't do the absolute values. Relative error is your, is your experimental value minus your theoretical value divided by your theoretical value, whoops, not equals, multiplied by 100. So let's see, so that was uh, 1.37, 1.37 minus 1.96 divided by 1.96, multiply that by 100. And we're getting pretty close to what the last period got, which is our relative error is equal to negative 30.1%. Okay, the negative tells us that we found an acceleration that was less than our expected acceleration. Well, one of the assumptions we made back over here when we drew the free body diagram is that we did not have any other exterior forces, which was wrong. What's going on with both of these pulleys? There's friction. Yeah, so there's friction, that's it, okay? Uh, and so friction actually accounted for messing up our acceleration a very noticeable amount. 